Good morning, everyone. Who just went actually to the keynotes? Who made it there? Oh, okay. Uh, half about. Cool. All right, so this is a 90-minute session. It's a combined intro and deep dive session for the Prometheus monitoring system. Um, so the first half, I'm just going to give a complete introductory beginner's talk to what is Prometheus, how does it work, why is it awesome. And the second half of the talk is really just completely free form, Prometheus maintainers being asked any questions by you, uh, which will be led by Richard after me. So in about like 30 or 40 minutes. All right, so I am Julius. I'm the, uh, one of the co-founders of the Prometheus monitoring systems. And uh, nowadays I just freelance around it. I help companies use it, do training, software development around it and so on. Um, so let's start with you know, what Prometheus actually is. Prometheus is a whole stack for monitoring and alerting that is based around metrics, AKA time series. And we aim to give you like all the tools for that, like getting metrics out of the things you care about, collecting them, and then doing useful things with those metrics. Um, so alerting, graphing, and also digging around in the data on a more ad hoc basis. Prometheus was especially made for dynamic environments like Kubernetes, even though Kubernetes didn't even exist yet when we created Prometheus. We explicitly do not do some other things. So we try to keep the scope of Prometheus fairly limited and simple. Uh, we don't do logging or tracing. We only do numeric time series data where you have individual values that have some kind of development over time. For logging, which you still want to have as well, you might use a system like Loki or Elasticsearch. For tracing, maybe you'll use uh, Jaeger or Zipkin. We give you a way to define alerting rules that can be maybe very complex, but they're always explicit, and you have to define what means, uh, what a bad condition actually means. So the system doesn't do any kind of automatic anomaly detection, just squinting at your data and, and kind of guessing that something might be wrong. Prometheus itself also only has a local on-disk storage, which is naturally somewhat limited in its scalability and durability because it's a single node system and there's no built-in replication. So um, we'll talk about long-term storage and scalability a tiny bit more later. There's ways to do that, but it's not part of Prometheus itself. <laughs> Prometheus started in 2012 at SoundCloud. That was when uh, both I and Matt kind of came from Google and tried to make SoundCloud more stable. And back in the day, SoundCloud already had a cluster scheduler before Docker even existed. So obviously no Kubernetes yet, no Grafana yet, no none of these fancy tools. And the, op the open source monitoring tools back then weren't really suitable for making sense of dynamic cluster scheduling uh, with containers floating around and all that. So this led to the birth of Prometheus. Uh, it was open source from day zero, but we only really published it in 2015. And then in 2016, it became the second member project of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is hosting this conference here today, um, after Kubernetes. And you can find us at Prometheus.io. If you go to slash community, you'll also find ways to get help and become a contributor, which would be extra awesome. So let's have a look at the basic system architecture of what, you know, how Prometheus works and what it allows you to do. First of all, we want you to be able to get metrics out of the things you care about. And the things you care about can be different things. For example, they might be applications, services, running in your cluster where you control the code, your own web API server, et cetera, et cetera. In those examples, the best thing to do is really just take a Prometheus client library, include it into your process, and use it for two things. To track metrics, counters, histograms, gauges, summaries, basically just keeping, keeping uh, track of internal metric state. And then the second uh, part is exposing that over an HTTP endpoint because Prometheus is a pool-based monitoring system and expects to be able to go to your instance and ask it about the current value of all its time series that it is tracking. Now, you might have some stuff where you cannot directly add stuff, uh, add 
Prometheus metrics to the code itself, like a Linux virtual machine or a MySQL daemon or the C groups container information on the machine. And there's many, many of these uh, existing systems where you will not be able to add directly a Prometheus endpoint. So for this, we have the concept of an exporter, which you run as a sidecar next to the thing you want to measure. And uh, then Prometheus just talks to the exporter, and the exporter gets the metrics in the back end in whatever third-party format that is, um, and translates them back to, Prometheus server, uh, to the Prometheus format. So finally, we add a Prometheus server. The Prometheus server is the heart of the Prometheus ecosystem, obviously. Um, you configure it to pull on a periodic basis. It's like every 15 seconds, every 30 seconds are, for example, common values to pull metrics from all the targets that are configured in it. And then it stores those over time as time series. So just a quick interlude. What do we actually transfer on these arrows here? What does that format look like? It just looks like this without the colors, of course, <laughs> but the colors make it more readable. It's really just a text-based format that we defined in Prometheus where every time series has a single sample. It's just the current value of each time series that is being sent at that moment in time. Um, and so this is really, really dead simple to generate from even a bash script if you need to, but if you are in a more higher level programming language, you might uh, use one of our client libraries to do proper tracking and exposition. So the hurdle to get metrics out of things you care about is actually pretty low, as long as you can pull. We'll talk about the data model a bit more later. Okay, cool, so now we have the Prometheus server. It stores it in a very you know, highly efficient time series database, um, and then you might be wondering, well, how does Prometheus actually know where all these targets are? We don't require you to statically configure each one of your Kubernetes pods, for example. Uh, obviously, Prometheus integrates with different service discovery mechanisms to allow you to do that and automatically discover what is out there. Finally, to do useful stuff with the data, we, uh, for example, Grafana, you know, the most popular dashboard builder, has native support for Prometheus as a graphing backend. You can use Prometheus' web UI to dig around in the data yourself, or just build any kind of automation against Prometheus' HTTP API yourself as well. Then Prometheus itself, in the server, you can configure some alerting rules, which Prometheus will periodically evaluate on the collected data to determine if anything's wrong. And if something is wrong, it sends alerts to another component called the alert manager, and the alert manager aggregates alerts over time and across dimensions and kind of groups them together and then sends actual notifications to email, pager duty, ops genie, and a couple of other mechanisms. You can build your own as well. Um, so this is just the basic architecture. And then you'll have like many of these different exporters and integrations um, and stuff that is built around it basically. Typically, you have many Prometheus servers in your organization because these are, you know, the this individual server is not a horizontally scalable thing. So, you know, you might chart them by function or you can build trees that form, yeah, like a hierarchical uh, topology to achieve different scaling goals. So, the four, these four points uh, are four major reasons why I think Prometheus was successful especially back then. Nowadays, maybe they're not even so special anymore, but I think in 2015, when we released it, there were a bit more. So, you know, a data model that's dimensional, then a query language that goes along with it to do powerful things, the simplicity and efficiency of a single Prometheus server, and then integrating with service discovery to make Prometheus work in, dyna in dynamic environments. First, the data model. So I'll go through these four points in, in detail. Prometheus fundamentally tracks time series. So these are values over time where the identifier stays the same. For example, the identifier on an abstract level might be something like the temperature in this room versus the temperature in the other room, right? And we just want to kind of track the same thing, but over time, how it develops. And uh, for tracking that over time, we add timestamp value pairs, which we call samples that belong to the time series. Timestamps 
in Prometheus are always in 64, keep it simple. Uh, they are basically millisecond Unix timestamps. The sample values also only can have a single type, which is always float64, which works remarkably well for systems monitoring use cases. And then the big question is here, what's the identifier? Like, how do we identify time series? Because this will inform how we search and query for metrics. We decided to go for a dimensional key value based model where we start with a metric name at the beginning. This is just the name of the aspect of a system we are monitoring. In this case, this is a counter metric. How many HTTP requests has a server handled since process startup? It just goes up and up and up. And now we want to sub-differentiate certain dimensions in there, like was it, what was the path of the request, the status code, et cetera, et cetera. So these we just attach as what we call labels, key value pairs, um, and this data model is pretty flexible. It avoids having a hierarchy as we had in earlier monitoring systems like uh, Graphite or StatsD, where the metric name is somewhat akin to a path name um, with hierarchy components. And then often, you know, if you add a new dimension, you're not sure where in the hierarchy you would want to stick it, uh, which component has which meaning. Um, so this is a bit more flexible and explicit and useful in queries. So now to make use of this, Prometheus comes with its own new query language that's called PromQL, the Prometheus query language. It's explicitly not a SQL style language because SQL style languages tend to be a bit obtuse when trying to do time series operations. So PromQL is especially optimized to having a succinct way of expressing the typical computations we want to do with uh, time series in the systems monitoring context. Here's some examples. Imagine you're running this one exporter that we have, it's called the node exporter. It runs on every Linux node that you have or Unix node and it gives you machine metrics. For example, the total size of every file system in your infrastructure. Um, and now you wanna know, well, you know, give me all the partitions that are larger than 100 gigabytes in my infrastructure but that, that, that are not mounted on the root mount point. You might just start with a metric name, then filter down with a negative matcher basically saying give me only the time series that belong not to the root mount point, then divide all those values by a billion to get from bytes to gigabytes, and then filter the time series by 100 to only get the ones that are larger than 100 gigabytes. And as an output set, you'll not get a single number, you get a whole set of result computed time series um, with labels on them, so you know where which partitions are which are larger than this. Another common thing you might want to do is calculate request error rate ratios. So like how many errors are you getting in comparison to the total number of requests? Um, for this, you could take the per second rate of the 500 status code requests and divide it. Here's, here's a division operator, so this is all one expression. Divide it um, by the total number of requests, so the request rate of that. And this would give you a ratio. Um, a single number, a bit boring. Sometimes you might want to preserve some dimensions, like the path, give me this ratio for every path in my web application. For that, you just add a modifier to the sum aggregator and then it preserves some dimensions and now is where magic actually starts happening because you're no longer dividing one number by another number, you're dividing a whole set of numbers by a whole other set of numbers on the left, on the right hand side. And PromQL automatically joins these sets of time series based on identical label sets. So it will divide the error rate for one path by the total rate for that same path and propagate that as an equally labeled element into the output. So this whole label-based uh, automatic joining is really powerful. And there's you know, more complex ways of doing this if labels don't exactly match up on both sides. Just another example, won't go really into this, but uh, we allow you to, for example, track latency distributions in a histogram metric and then have a query language function which allows you to say, hey, I want to calculate the 99th, quant the 99th percentile from this histogram uh, over all of my instances. So I want to aggregate away the instance dimension and I want to average that over five minutes. This is what this expression does. 
And then you get, you know, for all your paths and all your methods, you get the 99th percentile latency as an estimate. Now, if you learn that language, which admittedly can warp your brain a bit at the beginning, but then becomes really useful, you can start using it either in the built-in expression browser or even graph those expressions over time. But this is not really good for building persistent dashboards with all the dashboarding features that you're used to. So for that, just use, go use Grafana. Um, it has native Prometheus support. Now, a really cool thing is alerting and how it integrates with this language in a unified way. So alerting is no longer a separate system that just runs check scripts somewhere on hosts. Uh, first, like the, the whole idea of Prometheus is you collect anything you can imagine as a metric first, even if it's just like a Boolean value, zero, one, or two, um, or, or like an enum, uh, because that is stored really efficiently, and then you define alerting rules based on the collected data. So in this example, I took an expression that we had earlier, which gives us the error rate ratio for every path. We multiply it by 100 to get to a percentage and we filter it by five to get all the paths that have an error rate ratio higher than 5%. And so this would really give you an alert for every path that is currently misbehaving. And yeah, this can get way more complex as well. Third point, operational simplicity. Um, you know, Prometheus as a single binary uh, service and single node service is pretty easy to get started with. It only needs a small configuration file, it puts its local data on disk, and off you go. Um, you can get high availability for the purpose of alerting by just running two identical Prometheus servers which pull the same data. Uh, so they know nothing about each other, they're not a cluster, they just do the same thing, they ingest the same data, generate the same alerts, alert manager will dedupe that for you and it's written in Go. A single server, if it's a really beefy one, can also do quite a lot. Obviously, it's not infinitely horizontally scalable, but it can do in the lower number of millions of series. If you really, really overdo it, you might be able to get like a million plus samples on ingestion per second. And the storage on disk of each time series sample is also really efficient, about like one to two bytes per sample. So the local storage is really only meant as an ephemeral window of data that you keep maybe for weeks, maybe for months. Some people, like this guy who's currently looking in his phone, Richie, he's like keeping years in there, uh, and we tell him, well, that's not really what it's designed for. Um, <laughs> so there are ways of you know, keep sending Prometheus data to a remote system that can keep it for longer or do other stuff with it. For example, we have this remote write protocol in Prometheus where you can configure just a URL endpoint in Prometheus saying, hey, Prometheus, whatever you scrape, also forward it to some other endpoint. And that other endpoint just needs to implement our protocol and can then do anything with it. So either it natively supports that, like Cortex or InfluxDB, which can directly receive this format and store the data forever, or you can have any kind of database or stream processor and put a little adapter in front of it that converts. Or, Another thing I really like is Thanos. Who has heard of Thanos? Okay, you should all hear of Thanos. Uh, this was only like one-sixth of people or so. Um, Thanos was also built by people who are like both core Prometheus people and uh, had another need, basically, you know, getting a unified view that's long-term storage, unified view with durability over multiple Prometheus uh, servers in your organization. This works a bit differently than the remote write pattern that I showed before. Basically, you add a Thanos sidecar to all of your existing Prometheus servers. You can keep them as is. And then Thanos kind of watches the disk for any completed TSDB time series database blocks and ships them off to some long-term storage. This could be S3, GCS, or something you host your, on your own, some object storage. And then you can just point Grafana at the Thanos query component which integrates data from long-term storage with the short-term data from your live Prometheus instances. And then has some magic for actually also if you have an HA pair of Prometheuses to only show you the data from one in a consistent way and so on. So it's, it's really cool. Last point of the selling points of Prometheus is how it works with dynamic environments. So the old world was static. 
for a long time now it hasn't been anymore. First came dynamic VMs, then we put cluster schedulers like Kubernetes on top, and we have microservices on top of that. So things are moving really quickly and automatically uh, and so on. So like, how does a monitoring system still make sense of what is supposed to be where? Our answer, obviously, is service discovery in three different ways here. So Prometheus uses service discovery for three different purposes that are related but different. The first is really your monitoring system should know what is supposed to be where. Um, with some push-based monitoring systems, they kind of receive data from whatever sending data, but they don't really know if someone should report in but isn't. So um, that's the first purpose. Then the second one is the service discovery information usually gives you technical information for how to actually reach a target and pull metrics from it. Otherwise, you cannot do your job. The third one is if it's a good service discovery mechanism, like the one in Kubernetes through the API server, it will give you metadata about the target that you have discovered and that you're scraping. For example, it will tell you, hey, this is an Nginx pod of a certain other label quality and so on. And then Prometheus can map that into your time series data. Prometheus has built-in discovery support for a bunch of cloud providers and clusters, uh, cluster managers. And it also has generic mechanisms like DNS, console, and so on. You can also build your own plugin-based mechanism based on a file watcher um, if the built-in ones are not sufficient. So as a conclusion, these four selling points really help make Prometheus a suitable fit for the cloud-native world uh, and making sense of a lot of the data that happens there. Cool, so I briefly say thanks, but then I immediately skip to the Prometheus deep dive and open Q&A, so spare your questions for that. Richie is going to lead that, and I'll hand over to Richie. Okay, uh, welcome. Anyone who is on Prometheus team, for example, Tom, uh, just come up here. And thanks to Rob for volunteering to do the MIG work. <laughs> he didn't know he was volunteering, but he does know. Okay, so uh, once again, this is open Q&A. Um, for technical or whatever reasons, we are required to call this deep dive, but it's basically an open Q&A. Um, there are no stupid questions, so please, any level of question you feel comfortable asking, just ask them. Um, it's totally fine. We will then assign questions to whoever is standing here. Um, the only... Okay. Okay. Like this? Far? Okay, like this. Okay, yeah. Like this? Okay, so everyone else, this is how we have to hold this thing, because unfortunately, CNCF can only afford two mix per room, even though I complain every single year. Anyway, um, where was I? Yeah, so we, no, we're not yet at the question. So um, any, any level of questions is fine. Please, just whatever you want to ask, ask it. We only ask one thing, um, don't have like a lightning talk. So it, it should be a real question. It shouldn't be a statement, of course, that, that basically takes away from question time for everyone else. We have roughly one hour left, which is great, and we hope to fill this with stuff, and also we will probably fill up with more of Prometheus team as they, as they come in here. So, have at it. Oh yeah, intros, good point. Uh, Rob is running around. Um, so intros, Julius, uh, he's the co-founder of Prometheus. We have Max. He's, well, all of us is Prometheus team, so I'm just doing the names. Uh, Julius Foltz, Max Innen, Richard Hartmann, Brian Brazil, Tom Wilkie, and Gautham, it's Gautham. <laughs> I can't pronounce the name. Um, so yeah, have at it. Um, 
My question is about uh, a problem I face with Prometheus when there is a hole, holes inside the time series. Uh, for instance, you, you get data from a node, but this node uh, was uh, out of service for something like, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes. So you don't get any metrics from the node for 20 minutes. So how can we kind of, of, of deal with these holes when you make some things like sum over time or this kind of operation to, to get a consistent result? Uh, I, I hope my... Uh, so to my just to make sure we understand the question, is your question if, if connectivity to a node which should be scraped is going away, how to not lose data from the point of view of Prometheus during that outage? Is that the question? Yes. Is there a kind of normalization of the data uh, in the old to... to mm. oh, yes, this, this was my question. My, my question was not very clear, I'm sorry. But it's how to deal with the holes inside a, a time series. Is uh. that what he was asking? <laughs> okay, uh, so, so, so if the question is how to deal with outages and not being able to reach nodes which are up but not seen by Prometheus, you have to put a Prometheus in a place where it can be seen uh, and where, where it can see uh, the nodes. So if you have this kind of issue, it makes sense to have a Prometheus nearer to whatever your workload is, maybe have a local instance or whatever, and then uh, use remote read write or, or um, federation to get data to wherever you need it. That's more or less it. Of course, if Prometheus can't see the data, it can't really put it in. We currently don't do backfilling. Yeah, and generally Prometheus takes a stance to gaps in data to just say like, oh well, now you have a gap, it's fine. Uh, because Prometheus is not the system that tries to keep 100% of your data forever consistently. It tries to tell you like, what is wrong right now? And if I cannot reach your node at that moment, like that's the main problem and we don't care anymore. Like what are the actual metrics of that node? You need to figure, figure that out after getting alert for that. Yeah. There's one over here. So a question on multi-tenancy. How do you, I know that you don't handle multi-tenancy kind of inbuilt in Prometheus, but what are your suggestions? Which add-ons or extra services would you use to build a multi-tenant Prometheus and probably also connect it to a multi-tenant Grafana? I think if, uh, if Frederick was here, he'd promote the Prometheus operator. Oh, yeah, that's the right match for this. Um, so we have been trying to solve that. Um, what is very helpful in Prometheus itself is the query language is not that complex. So what you can do is you, you put a proxy in front of Prometheus that enforces certain labels. And then you do your tenancy based on certain namespaces, for example. It's super common to run multiple Prometheuses, like a Prometheus per team. Like Prometheus is super lightweight. Like if you're in a Kubernetes environment, having a Prometheus per namespace is not a big deal. Um, so if you want to do multi-tenancy that way, the Kubernetes Prometheus operator makes it pretty easy to do that, as far as I understand. And then, yeah, you know, Cortex does it. Does Thanos have multi-tenancy? They're working on it, aren't they? I think last time I spoke to Bartek about it, Thanos, there's, there's ways of doing multi-tenancy in Thanos as well. So there's a whole bunch of different ways, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And please yell into the microphone because all of the speakers are facing the audience direction, so we have like a hard time hearing. Hello. Louder. Is it audible? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would like to know more about the remote write. Okay, so. I mean, how, how does it work? Remote write. Remote write. Oh, remote write. Remote write. Uh, what's the question about remote write? Because we have really a hard time hearing anyone. Uh, uh, is it fine? Yeah, yell into the microphone. Or yell okay, so <laughs> the, it's more about the remote write. Okay, so you mentioned somewhere in the architectural diagram that you can transfer this data, like Prometheus generated data, to some uh, another adapter. Okay, so uh, through writing some remote write, so can you just expand more about that? Yeah, sure. So there's a remote write um, protocol 
which is using proto buffers and snappy encoding in a HTTP body. You can set an endpoint in the Prometheus config that will tell Prometheus to send the data it's scraping to somewhere, right? And then, I mean, there are tens of people that have implemented this uh, protocol on the server side to accept data. So there's tens, maybe, is that exaggerating? <laughs> like, Julius implemented an adapter for Influx and then got merged into Influx, as far as I understand. Um, there's one for OpenTSDB. Cortex accepts it. Victoria Metrics, which just open source today, that accepts it. Um, Timescale accepts it, like a whole bunch of people accept it. It's super easy, especially if the thing trying to accept it is written in Go, it can just vendor the remote write um, stuff from Cortex, uh, from Prometheus. Um, <laughs> another thing to add is recently we rewrote the remote write API, mm -hmm. uh, SPI, I guess. So now it actually tails the Prometheus write ahead log. So it deals really well now with uh, network outages. If there's a network outage, Prometheus will buffer up on disk the samples, and when the network comes back, it will try and resend them. OK. Cool. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yed. First of all, thank you very much for your work and the efforts. Uh, as a young as user, I really uh, miss uh, empowering uh, Alert Manager uh, for two things. The first one is uh, do some complex mathematics uh, functions to before the alert. And the second one is uh, aggregate multi inputs before uh, trigger uh, an alert. What's the question there? Okay. For the first example, uh, there is uh, some mathematic uh, function like percentile that uh, we already seen, but what about uh, having some more complex mathematic functions? So this is for the first part. The second one is, for example, I have a machine one, a machine A, that, that trigger one alert. But I have also a HTTP uh, B uh, trigger alert. I want to trigger only uh, the C alert is the sum of the, these two alerts together. So aggregate uh, alerting inputs. Thank you. OK. So you can do anything you want in PromptQL. It is proven to be Turing complete. Please don't try that in production. So if you want to do that, you can express it in PromptQL. Uh, then your first question, which I've already forgotten. Uh, can, can you do maths and alerts? Oh, yeah. Can you do maths and alerts? Yes, you can do arbitrary maths. You've got addition, subtraction, division. In general, you can do it. Like We don't have trigonometric functions, which you might get from graphite, but no one's come up with a use case yet. Second question was, um, can I do trigger alerts? Yeah, yeah that's covered. Yeah. Yeah. Already answered that. OK, well, I mean, there's, there's, logic, there's logic operators in Prometheus Plus. So you can do union and or and so on. So to do your A and B, you would literally just write the expression for A and the expression for B, and an and in the middle. And then that would be your expression for C. Does that cover it? Yeah, in Alert Manager, you can also define dependencies between alerts uh, or services, saying like if if that one thing fires, don't send me notification for the other thing. Like if 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 the whole data center is down, don't alert me for services in that data center, for example. Um, so I've got a question around, I guess you see Prometheus being used in things like Linkerd and other different projects. Um, and you'll get to a stage potentially where you've got a few different instances of Prometheus um, on your clusters, maybe across different clusters. Are there any kind of recommended practices about how you go and get those communicating and kind of architect from that perspective that you can share? Do you want to do federating? I'll do Cortex. Okay. Uh, yeah, so as, as mentioned in the uh, Julius's talk, a uh, key aspect is reliability. So generally, you want any alerting for that cluster to come from that Prometheus, because then you don't have extra hops. Uh, the next type of question is, how do I do graphing? And well, there's dashboard templating and so on in Grafana. Uh, so a single Grafana, because you only need one and just have a HA MySQL somehow, wherever you usually do that. Uh, then you can have a global Prometheus pulling aggregated data via federation. Because if you want to get something like global requests, you cannot calculate that in a per cluster Prometheus. You need to get all the data somewhere. So normally, you'd get all the aggregated data into a cluster Prometheus if you've got like multiple Kubernetes, and then aggregate there, and then up to a global where you do more math uh, and do it there. 
this is not to everyone's taste. Once you do ad hoc queries, like that's fine when you know all your queries in advance because you can make that all nice and efficient with federation, uh, in which case you get to the other options. So yeah, so federation, the other option is to use remote write to push to some central database of which, you know, we've just listed a bunch of them. I represent Cortex, so Cortex is a horizontally scalable implementation of the Prometheus APIs. So that way you can use the same PromQL expressions you would on your Prometheus nodes in the global way, you know, against a single horizontally scalable Cortex cluster. But you can do the same with InfluxDB if you want to earn Flux and Influx languages. You can do the same with M3, uh, a bunch of other ones. And then the third way, yeah, I'm a Thanos maintainer. So the third way is to, if you don't want to use pushing metrics or federating, so replicating the uh, the data in the multiple places, you can essentially just use um, a Thanos, which is um, a solution that allows you to have a long-term storage, but also it allows global querying. So you put you know, you start some um, component on the global level that does prom query evaluation and grabs the data, queries them directly from the Prometheus instances or object storage, um, which is yeah, yet another option you can choose. Cool. Thank you. Apparently, I'm the mic holder. I just think it's cool there's so many options to that now. Is there a way yeah, to turn this monitor on? Oh, we, it is on. It is on. It's way better now. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yes, it is literally a monitor. <laughs> but now the people at the front can't hear what we're saying. Oh. Hi. Um, <laughs> my question is regarding data reduction or automatic cleanup of old data. What is your approach to this? Uh, so the question is data cleanup. So I assume there's two parts, which is deleting data you don't have any need, and implicitly also downsampling. So the first thing to note is that Prometheus itself is pretty efficient in terms of data storage. We're talking 1.6, 1.7 bytes per sample is typical in production. If you go to a, another system like Graphite or MRTG, it is, you might be talking 40 bytes, 100 bytes, 200 bytes, depending on what system. So first off, because Prometheus is so efficient, your need to clean up data is substantially less. Now, there is the retention time, which you can specify a time limit for Prometheus, and it'll take care of it. There's also a size limit as of two, three versions ago. Uh, another option you have, then, is there is no downsampling inside Prometheus itself. That's kind of a more uh, long, uh, cluster storage thing, which Thanos has. Uh, and it turns out to be useful. You need, like, an hour because of complexity. Uh, and then the other thing is there is a delete API in Prometheus, so you can't delete data. So in principle, you could have the data inside Prometheus and then just delete everything that's not aggregated after a month or something. But that's not an API you want to be hitting every five minutes. Do you want something? Covered? Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, about the remote write thing. <laughs> Does it handle sending aggregates as opposed to sending every metrics just to save on bandwidth and such? I mean, you can, you can build recording rules and then you can filter. <laughs> it's a long cable. You can build recording rules in Prometheus, which does the aggregation, and then you can use um, relabeling rules on your remote write path to drop everything else and only send recording rules. Um, so yes, but I, we don't do that. We just send it all. OK, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, you uh, probably a more general point is that <laughs> uh, Prometheus is relatively dumb in how it works. There's no autumn optimization or so on. You have to add the recording rules yourself. And if you ask it to do something, it will do it. These days we have isolation and whatnot, not to oom when that happens. But if you ask it to go across 10 gigs of data, it is going to go across 10 gigs of data. And then that just takes time, because it takes up time to process 10 gigs of data. If you want a recording rule, you might be able to cut that down to 100 megs or something. But at the end of the day, if you want to process a lot of data, you're processing it a lot. If it's going via remote read, you know, we have to send all that data over the wire against, if it's just on side one Prometheus, then that's only going over the system bus. So it's going to be quite a bit faster. Cool. I'm sorry, I have to run, because I'm, I have to run. I'm giving a talk, so. <laughs> Good luck. All right. So, I have a question about the uh, about the 
scrape interval. So Julius in the presentation mentioned a typical scrape interval might be 15 or 30 seconds. So I'm wondering, is there guidance there for a certain number of metrics, a certain number of scrape endpoints, what the practical lower limit is for the scrape interval, and then similarly for the evaluation interval of alerts, depending on how many rules and complexity of those rules, et cetera? So it kind of depends on your data and what you want to achieve. Um, generally speaking, we suggest within one Prometheus instance, you keep the same scrape time for everything, so you don't start mixing within what, one instance. You can, but th th there are certain reasons why, why you probably shouldn't. Of course, it will make your life easier in some regards. But it, this is basically just a question of how, what does your workload look like? The only thing is you shouldn't go above two minutes. Of course, you'll start timing out after five, and then if you miss one scrape, blah, blah, blah. So that, that kind of sucks. But else, up to two minutes, do whatever. But Exactly. I'm thinking oh, the lower, about, um, what, you know, what the like ultra second. high frequency. Yeah, second basically. is probably the, the lowest, which which you should be doing, I guess. I mean, you can do lower, but does anyone of you do lower? Uh, Percona does. They they ask, ask for sub-second to be supported. Uh, but I would personally consider that below 15 or 5 seconds, you're getting into profiling. And even getting endpoints to respond that quickly, you, you know, it can be it can be difficult. Why are you, you, you do SNMP, you know it's slow. Uh, but, but do think about which tool is appropriate. Like if you want to every now and then just hammer something to get detailed stats, you can. If you're doing that all the time, you might end up using too much CPU. If you start getting into networks, black box exporter is something which potentially you want to hit every single second. For, for ICMP probes, maybe even for HTTP stuff, to really get a good picture of how stuff changes over time. But this is more on the networking side, not so much on the service side itself. Thanks. Uh, we should add, if you are using the black box exporter with such a short thing, it does automatic timeouts, and it always knocks 500 milliseconds off them according to a command line flag. You probably want that shorter if you're doing that. Hello. Um, I just a question about the aggregators. If I want to add new aggregators, is it easy? Have you uh, a plugin API or something like this? Uh, new exporters? No, new aggregators. Yeah. So like some max. Yes. Uh, well, the code is there, it's not too hard to add them, but you have to add them in the source code. And then we'd have to ask the question of, okay, how useful is that? Is that very similar to something we already have and so on? Because we already have 11 aggregators and 50 something functions. And if we're just adding a function, like we have a standard deviation, which is population standard deviation, but we don't have sample standard deviation. And if someone were to request that, I'd ask the question of, why do you care? It's basically the same number. <laughs> um, because one is just dividing by n, one is dividing by n minus one. Uh, and that, that sort of question will be asked. Like, I think we've got a pretty good coverage. Uh, which aggregator are you considering? Uh, like uh, the median aggregator or? There's already a quantile, so just pass 0.5 to it. OK. And uh, do, do you have uh, vertical aggregators? Between uh, time series? Yeah, so all the overtimes are associated then with that. I, the only exception there is count values doesn't have one, but all the rest of them are there. Thank you. Oh, and I guess top K and bottom K are not overtime either. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you thought about uh, separating writing and scraping uh, of reading, because I have a lot of users in my corporation that have Grafana dashboards, and when they open it on a one month period, they just kill the Prometheus because of uh, um, uh, um killed. And uh, I was uh, uh, thinking, can you separate reading the, uh, to the writing so that when they kill the Prometheus, it continues to scrape? Yeah, so first little answer is like there are some sanity limits in Prometheus to say X number of queries at the same time and as of uh, which version, I forgot, a couple of versions back now there's sample limits to how much one query can touch, but of course still you have the problem, uh, yeah, during an outage everyone wants to see what's going on and everyone's firing up their Grafana. Um, you, we haven't really 
thought about completely separating that yet because it's still it's all one process and it's one server, so it's a bit hard to do. Um, but there's uh, different things you can do. You could, of course, run one Prometheus that or multiple Prometheuses that are just for being queried and not doing your alerting workload. Um, but then also what GitLab, for example, is doing, or uh, well, they're using a proxy between Grafana and Prometheus that is called Trickster from Comcast. You know this one? Yeah, uh, yeah and, and so this, uh, they host their public Prometheus dashboard with Grafana uh, with that. So with Trickster in between, and it caches a lot of the queries um, and makes it way more efficient for the, for the query load. But other than that, there's no magic bullet. Yeah. Uh, the other thing GitLab is doing is that the public Prometheus, which is exposed to the public, okay, down here. No, uh, farther, farther. Farther. no it's just air. Uh, so um, they have a separate Prometheus for that from their production one. So that even if people start sending big queries there, that their production monitoring is still okay. So if you have something public, public, you probably want a separate Prometheus to be safe. Yeah, yeah. and just to add, you can always you know, fall back to like, you know, integration system, extend, extension systems like Cortex or Thanos. They all essentially move the data away from the scraping part. So, so you keep Prometheus mainly for scraping and maybe you know, local alert evaluations, and you can actually make read path more you know, scalable, uh, com yeah, complex as well, and, and, and resilient and isolated with the, with the scraping part. And, and Cortex has already caching enabled, so you have this trickster built in. Thanos hopefully have that soon as well, so that's another option. All right, thank you. So I have two questions. So the first one is that I see the Prometheus server reach out to each exporter and applications to get metrics. So what if I want to send metrics in the other direction? For example, there may be infrequent events triggered by explicit user actions. So I wonder what, how can I get metrics in the case? The second question is, uh, because I'm a Java developer, I'd like to monitor like JVM statistics and performance. So I wonder if you have like built-in good support for monitoring JVMs like GC statistics, etc. Want to answer? So uh, I can answer the Java question as the client Java maintainer. Uh, like all client libraries, we try to export out of the box what we can that makes sense, which includes all the VMs, uh, the JVM stats, the thread stats, the memory pool stats. In the case of Java, for technical reasons, you do have to call default exports.initialize, uh, which is in the client Java hotspot module, and then you'll get all of those. Uh, the other question then is what happens if I want to push infrequent events? Uh, so if this is on a long running server and there's an event, you increment a counter and Prometheus will get it at the ne its next scrape. If this is a batch job, which is running every hour, every day or whatnot, uh, at the end of its run, it would push the metrics to the push gateway and then Prometheus will scrape that regularly. Does that answer your questions? What about a, a web application and a user takes a certain action and I'd like to capture that kind of metrics real time. Ah, so you want to track uh, front end metrics, uh, like how many users are clicking a certain button on my website? Yeah. Um, so for that, first you would need to send that event to something in your data center that can count that event with dimensions, right? This button with a certain so-and-so has been clicked so many times. Um, there's one of these projects by Weaveworks. Uh, is it called um, Prom? something, something, prom, prom JS, I think was the front end side of it that sends the event to the back end, and then there's another thing in the back end, I don't know if it was like promgregator or something. <laughs> yeah, promgregator, <laughs> um, which then aggregates these counters and then you can scrape that using Prometheus. Uh, Prometheus wasn't really built for doing front end metrics, but in that way it can be abused to, to do that. Or used. Or used. You should really start with diaphragm. So for uh, 
so for the running communication in HA, you said that you will be running two servers, you know, same and all the data will be replicated. So if I have to do the remote write, what data I send because I don't want to send the replica of both the data through my remote. If I can answer that. So, uh, like you can do two things. You can you can say only Prometheus one writes to the remote write, uh, and Prometheus two is HA. Or there are systems out there like Timescale, now Cortex. You just add a new external label called underscore underscore replica to your Prometheus, and the remote system will deduplicate at ingest time. If Prometheus 1 goes down, the remote system will look at it and like, I haven't received any data for 15 seconds. I'm going to accept data from uh, Prometheus 2, for I example. I have to send all my data back uh, on the network from both the Prometheus. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's actually not a lot of network. And uh, my second question is like, uh, we always encounter problem with monitor, monitoring the monitor. So, uh, so what is the strategy around in Prometheus around like how to do that in a better okay. way? Yeah. Um, so what we do on OpenShift for that is we simply have Prometheus always firing alert, and then we pass that down to the entire pipeline, and whatever paging service you use, you have that paging service page you when that alert is not firing. So it's a dead man switch, like on trains, for example, right? If something is not touching the, the switch, it's this firing. Is like creating another monitor. Sorry? This is like creating another monitor, which is kind of a dumb monitor for Prometheus. So we don't have Prometheus monitoring Prometheus. We have that via dead man switch. Sorry. Do you want to? Yeah, so this dead man switch uh, thing is kind of the last resort that you can add that Max mentioned. <laughs> so it's an always firing alert, and then an external service notifies you if it does not receive that alert every one minute or so, right? So, oh, something in your alerting infrastructure is completely dead now, uh, and then it alerts you. Um, but before that, you can already meta-monitor Prometheus normally using Prometheus. So Prometheus itself also exposes Prometheus metrics alert manager as well. So you would have a meta-monitoring Prometheus set up, which just scrapes your other Prometheus components, and then you can have really uh, more complex alerting rules defined in there, like, hey, this Prometheus stopped ingesting, or hey, this queries are really slow in this one, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can have like proper alerting rules, and then this last one, that's the whole pipeline kind of end-to-end -end test, that's more as a like last resort. Uh, do, you, do you have any uh, HTTP REST API or something which can just query based on the PromQL data and extract the data like instead of doing the remote write? Um, it's called the query API. You're, it's the same API you use to query Prometheus. You can use that. Uh, like there are, uh, you, you can just send a request, you get JSON back and you can parse that. I see. Yeah. So, uh, so what is what is the recommended approach? Like, is it uh, querying the Prometheus server directly, like to extract the data, or going via the remote write? So, um, essentially, you can do both. It depends on your use case. A remote write is just to ship all the data to a remote source, so yeah. that you can visualize or uh, do operations on the data in the remote source. But the query API, if you just want to ask Prometheus, "Hey, give me data," you can just use the uh, query API and the remote. Uh, there's also a remote read API where you can get raw data from Prometheus. You can also use that. It all depends on your use case. But remote write is typically when you want to run the queries and analysis on the remote system. Okay. Okay. And there is no like a uh, impact on the server, right? If I use the query API. Um, like you are extracting data, of course, like you're, you're sending queries to Prometheus, there's uh, always the uh, query load. But depending on, if, you, if you're just using remote read, uh, if you're not reading a lot of data, there's like not much uh, impact. But if you're reading like lots of data, remote read takes up a lot of memory. Uh, but we are working on improving the remote read to be streaming to use less memory and all of that. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you.
question just now. Uh, so one question from our side, because people are drifting off slowly, um, and this is directly the inverse from all the other KubeCons, where the deep dive had a lot more visitors than the intro session, and we always did the deep dive the same thing, or the same way. So first question is, who of you is aware that Prometheus has a booth in the, in the sponsor se uh, section? Okay. Uh, who of you visited this booth? Okay. So would you say it's fair to say that when we have the, who, who thinks that now that we have that booth, um, having this open Q&A is, is less pressing and less interesting? Of course, we have this default way of, of getting people's question answered. That's a show of hand question. <laughs> Okay, so show of hands if you think that now that we have a booth, the need for, for structuring Q&A like this goes down. Okay, so that's, that's kind of how, how I see the room anyway, but okay, that's good. I mean, it, it's kind of obvious, because normally the, the deep dive is always way fuller than the intro session, and this is the first time this is the inverse. You're not keeping in mind survival bias. These are I, all I the know. people who want to watch us. This is why I'm asking now and not in half an hour. That's <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was cussing at myself several times when even more people left and I didn't ask them. Uh, so do you guys have, or oh, gals, have any more questions? Of course, I mean, we are still here and we still have 25 minutes. Uh, it's more like uh, regarding alerting. I was wondering if you have plans to include uh, alerting based on thresholds, uh, based on labels. I mean, for example, I, I will just take something out of my mind. The IO weight of one server, it can be, the, the threshold can be different from a database than a, a storage server. Yeah. And I don't want to duplicate the alerts, and I just want to set different thresholds for the same alert. Uh, so if this is your own infrastructure, I would advise duplicating your alerts. If, however, these are coming from different customers, and there's like some database or UI or even source control they're coming from, there is a technique for doing this, and it's on my blog somewhere. I forget the name of it. I think it's uh, thresholds-based, was it? Yeah, using Time series as thresholds or something from robust. <laughs> yeah, using time series as thresholds sounds about right. I've got over 200 blogs. It's difficult to remember all the funny names I came up with. <laughs> yeah, but it's basically a trick with group left and using thresholds. But if it's your own infrastructure, honestly, it's simplest just to get <coughs> the alert. If it's your own infrastructure that you are running for yourself, it's easiest to duplicate the alert. Hi. Um, as a software developer um, that provides software that should expose metrics to uh, Prometheus, uh, do you have anything that uh, can assist me to ensure that those metrics are uh, provided by, with integration tests or something um, so that that I get in, in quality or um, with integration tests or with something else, some, some measures, I can ensure that uh, the software that is to be shipped will expose those metrics. You know? I can, I can say something. So, no? <laughs> well, what, what we do have is um, in the Prometheus release binary, uh, in the Prometheus release tarball, there's two binaries, Prometheus and PromTool, and PromTool has a check command which you can run against a metrics endpoint, and at least it will lint the metrics that are exposed, saying like, hey, this is a counter, but it has kind of the wrong convention in the name and things like this. So it will give you some clues to how to clean up your metrics a bit more. But if you're asking for something that really goes from an instrument application through recording and alerting rules to then alert manager routing rules and testing the whole thing end to end, uh, there's unfortunately, because it's kind of like a dynamic system through multiple stages, there's no way in Prometheus to really check the whole chain unless you build it all yourself and, and check that it works. Um, there, uh, yep. Um, I, I, it would actually be really cool if there were more, was more tooling around this, like if a binary somehow better could register its metrics and possible label values with some registry and then later on you can check and you can have like a checker tool run across your software, the rules based on it, and the alerting routing and so on. 
um, doesn't exist yet. Um, what another thing that exists is unit testing for alerts. Um, so you can actually also uh, with, uh, it's also another prompt tool command, you can write basically a spec. Uh, you can say like, okay, given this file that defines alerting rules, and given this input data, I expect to get the following output alerts. So you can write unit tests for your alerting rules, but you have to like specify you know, the, so the assumed data. You cannot actually check against some binary that you have that that binary would produce that data. So it's still limited. Yep, um, and I would, from the developer perspective, if you really want to go into like what, what uh, metrics I am exposing, right? I really recommend unit testing your metric as well. So, for example, in Golang, it's super easy that uh, there is like client Golang has uh, two float essentially methods. So, you essentially, can you know assert that when you increment some metric, you actually are doing that in your unit test. And I really recommend that. Sometimes it's too brittle to like do it, but sometimes you really care about this metric um, to be correct uh, in your code perspective. So like in our um, infrastructure, we do it a lot as well. Um, also, uh, if you, I, I'm not sure you, if this was the exact thing, thing that you mentioned, but the, in, uh, in the Go client, there's also a test util that actually does a scrape of the internal registry, basically. Um, and I think it's like test util gather and compare. And you can just say, this is the metric output that I would have expected if, if I had done a scrape of this application. And like in Kubernetes, this is used uh, like all over the place for a lot of metrics. And that's why we, how we basically test. Also, if you're using the Go library, like not using the global registry is quite helpful. And then you can like pass in registries into your components and then check the output uh, in very nice unit testing, like from a software engineering perspective. Uh, the other thing, um, if you do have a full CI CD thing, uh, and at least in your release processes, you might be checking as part of the release that, hey, has process CPU usage gone up? Uh, relative to requests and check that sort of thing for your key metrics. Uh, something else to keep in mind is how much should you unit test? Because if you think about log lines, like application logs, how often do you unit test? The answer is, well, when it's for billing and other important stuff like that. And I'd say it's similarly for metrics. Like if I'm writing an RPC library, the metrics are part of the main feature set, so those should probably be tested. But if it's just like a throwaway I, I compression just in case I ever need it, I wouldn't personally unit test that. And uh, part of the reason for that is like, yeah, I've seen systems, like big systems, and it turns about, about maybe 10% of them, the metrics are broken somehow, such as you forgot to register it, or um, that you, it just is monitoring the wrong thing. If you add unit testing, then that number should go down to maybe 5% because you're monitoring the wrong thing. But because you now have a rule that all metrics must be unit tested, you get far fewer metrics. So I think it's better to have, okay, we'll have more metrics, but you know, 5% more of them are broken, rather than, okay, everything's unit tested, but we have fewer metrics. Because then every little bit of data you can have when debugging an outage, when you're trying to figure out what's going on inside a piece of code is useful. Sometimes even if it is wrong. So what are the next big, big things for Prometheus? What are you working on? Uh, so big things, a lot of the things these days are happening in the ecosystem. So we've got things like Thanos and Cortex. In Prometheus itself, like I personally think it's reasonably near to feature completion, as in what Prometheus core should have. Like stuff coming up is the TLS stuff, um, which is currently slowly going through the node export and we'll do it elsewhere. Uh, bulk import and back, back uh, inserting recording rules is being worked on, and there's some UI stuff for Prometheus. Oh, yeah. What do we have? Yeah, open metrics, it always supports it. Uh, metadata, having more of that as well, because at the moment, Prometheus does not use that in PromQL. The data is available by the API if you want to look at it. Uh, I, I personally hope that's used by things like Grafana to make the user experience yes. easier. Uh, 
And that's about it. What else are the people up to? Everyone has some degree idea. Yeah. Um, some of us have discussed this, not, not necessarily everybody. Um, there, we may be looking into improving some of our APIs, like the remote read API. We've uh, thought about making, investigating how we could make some of our APIs streaming. But I think, um, like this, you, you can see the theme. I think we're not really planning any major feature work um, in core Prometheus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's what I was going to say. I think most of the interesting work around Prometheus these days is happening outside of Prometheus. So with Thanos and Cortex and some other projects, yeah, uh, to add more long-term durability, enterprise multi-tenancy, etc., features around it. So uh, yeah, uh, there were three maintainers of three different long-term storage for Prometheus. I, you seem to know yourselves pretty well. Are you planning on merging those things and have only one with all the good things about the free? Because it's. Uh, I mean, yeah, there is the possibility like that. Uh, there are definitely lots of advantages of this. So you actually have, as a user, like you don't have that many options, and there is joint force for uh, you know better enterprise support. But yeah, as you can imagine, merging the two projects are, or many projects are, are not easy. Like you can see on, I don't know, Open Telemetry, just doing that, it's it's quite epic adventure and long one as well, politics, uh, politics as well. And yeah, from from my side, like as a as a maintainer, I I. I I don't want to care about the politics that much. I want to build something that works for everyone and, and solve you know, all the use cases. So yeah, definitely we look forward to make it simple and more easy to understand and choose from. And maybe even include into Prometheus ecosystem as a, uh, some recommended tool. Yeah. Uh, one thing many people asked us for is scalability tests, basically give a recommendation of what a single Prometheus can take on a given uh, memory and a given uh, machine. So this is what we're trying to do. We need to, we're working on adding scalability tests. Uh, actually, I have a few more notes. Because <laughs> I've been at the boot for a long time and I took notes for what people were asking. Oh yeah, uh, I just <laughs> ah. I was oh, I was overzealous and uh, kind of bought too many stickers. So please take away stickers for your local communities, meetups, and stuff, and come say hi at the booth. Yeah. Yeah, I've got another note here for security for exporters. Yeah. It is there. Yeah. Okay, what else? Uh, <laughs> Community-driven exporters. Yeah. Yeah. It is there. Okay. <laughs> Open metric support. <laughs> it's there, okay. I guess that's it then. Maybe, maybe coming back to your question um, about uh, the two projects merging, I think uh, some of the work that we're investigating, like the, the remote read API being streaming, is actually um, that this could be like an inter exchange format for both projects potentially. Uh, like as I said, like this is totally exploratory. I don't know if that's gonna happen, but it seems um, some of us agree that this could be a good direction. Um, so that because both projects essentially promise long-term storage, right? If we now build a new thing and it's not compatible with the old thing, then uh, we've basically broken that trust and we definitely don't wanna do that. Um, so. Remote, like remote read, um, improving that, and maybe making that the APIs that both of these projects work with, that would also make merging much easier. On a, I think on a political level, I think we, like we're all good friends. Um, so we would love to work more closely together. Um, and Cortex has really cool features that Thanos would like. Thanos has really cool features Cortex would like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 we're, we're, to we're, we're completely aligned with that. Um, making that happen is not as easy as it sounds, but um, we want to, I, I want to see that as well. Yep. Like I can't necessarily speak for everyone, but I want to see that as well. So again, I'm a huge fan of Thanos and uh, Tom and Bartek are in London and they go out drinking and then they, 
and then uh, apparently there's an internal design doc on how to merge the two projects uh, so yeah it, uh, it we all want it to happen and we are working on it which type of beer mat is that internal design doc on <laughs> <laughs> There's maybe one more take on this. I mean, you, you have currently two main pressure points within Prometheus when it comes to stuff which you can solve by, by sharding. And this is basically the index and the storage. And that's why it just makes sense to, to address both in one single thing. Uh, the other, just for your information, we have this on the community side. Of course, you, uh, like for, for stuff which we want to do and such, our dev summit notes are out in the open and we will probably push publish something next week. Of course, after KubeCon, we'll also sit together and do team, team building slash dev summit. So there should probably be some results from this as well. And one of the things at the booth was like, give us constructive feedback and everyone is happy, which says, <laughs> yeah. Well, everyone's asking about long-term storage, I think, right? Yeah. And then we say Thanos. Or, or Cortex. sometimes Cortex, depending yeah. on it. Yeah. This is a total surprise to me. <laughs> Mike. Mike. The uh, first time uh, I installed Prometheus, it was uh, maybe uh, half and uh, maybe, yeah, one year ago. And it was the default value for retention was 40 days. I, and I was like, what, why? Uh, I set it to, for, to uh, one year, uh, not, not ask, asking any question because I didn't want, uh, I, I did not know uh, at that time that the storage wasn't, uh, wasn't compliant with that kind of retention. Now it is, it seems it is, but uh, if you want to read one year of your data, you are going, going to crush everything. But uh, except if you have a huge amount of memory. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, long-term storage is, uh, I think, uh, something expected for from everyone which is installing uh, Prometheus uh, from a, uh, a sysadmin point of view. Keep in mind that Prometheus is coming from a place where the most important thing is to to alert a human about things going wrong. And that is one of the core things. The other, if, if I'm being evil, I might say that Google doesn't care about anything which is beyond 14 days, so that's where that one was coming from. No, you're not getting the mic. <laughs> and they have other systems in, play, in place and such. Um, for anyone who, who has this as their own system, it's obvious that you need to have long-term retention. It's, it's obvious. Yeah, I but we all agree anyway, so I mean, uh, we can just keep on agreeing on long-term storage, but yes, it's something we want to have at some point in... in yeah, I before. understand that, but when we, you, yeah. the first time you come to a metric system, you accept it, uh, you're expecting to last forever. Okay. Even uh, if you are just doing monitoring on the two hours. Okay, yeah, hours. so uh, something else to keep in mind with the 15 days is that that's a default from three storage engines ago. And that storage engine was nowhere near as efficient. Like it was topping out at what fifty thousand samples per second, uh, and um, yeah, that's where that comes from. And we can only change that value on a major release. And the proposal to change it on v two, well, it was talked about, it, but it was never actually made because it would be a breaking change for users. Because if we suddenly bump that to infinity, which I believe was the proposal, users would run out of disk space and their monitoring falls over. So we will, at some point, presumably, change that default, uh, but we can only safely do it in a major version change. And uh, to be honest, I'm not sure there ever will be a V3. There might be at yeah. some point. Yeah. But you know, that, that's, uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to change, and it's just a misconception. Because especially with Prometheus 2, the question is, how much disk space do you have? Yeah. We would probably have a 3.x just for long-term storage. But <laughs> um, no, to be fair, and, and I mean, this is more like of a, of a discussion here in front and not so much Q&A, but um, this 14 days thing is, is stuck in the head of a lot of early adopters. And it, to me, it caused a lot of damage in, in the mind share of the community. Of course, it was something which a lot of people just fundamentally disagreed with. And for various reasons back then, that was the thing which was officially recommended. You could do it otherwise, but 
So, yeah. And I mean, we see this. This is still the stuff which people approach us most about. Of course, this is what hurt them back then. And they still have this at the back of their head. Yeah, and nowadays I try to sell Prometheus as a metrics-based monitoring and alerting stack, and I don't even mention time series database, or, well, I say it happens to include a time series database for that purpose, um, but it's not a time series database front and center. So it's a pretty specialized one for systems monitoring. But it's too good, so people use it yes. for this. Yeah. Um, I actually have Any a question. Any non-long, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and this is mainly just for the, the Thanos and the, uh, the the Cortex owners. I know Tom's not here, but um, yeah, no, I think uh, I I would love to ask a, a question of you know if, if there's any interest essentially in like looking at other um, open source long term storage projects to work to work with when when you consider I guess like a more longer term plan for a Prometheus native um, long term store. Uh, I know that uh, just on the indexing side at least, um, you know, a lot of work has gone into and I obviously have a bias and this is the reason I'm asking this question is because I um, the the maintainer of M of M3, which is an open source long term storage. Um, but you know I, I think uh, we are heavier users of uh, Prometheus, PromQL, we love the ecosystem, we'd love to be more in, involved. Um, so that's just kind of, a, maybe this is not right, the right format to be <laughs> asking the question, but. I mean, we try, like we are impressed by the insane scale that M3 has. You have more scale than any of us here, uh, which is like insane. Uh, we're super impressed. Uh, and we've actually looked at M3 uh, like, I know Fabian looked at M3 before starting Thanos, and there was no documentation back then. And uh, we've tried to open issues. There's like, yeah, it was all a big, huge black box that looked too complex back then. It, I think it changed a lot now, and we should take another look. But uh, yeah, I mean, if, if like, uh, it just happens uh, that uh, we know uh, Thanos has a lot of great things, Cortex has a lot of great things, but we should also look at what M3 can add to the table, given, uh, the scale and everything that you've achieved. Awesome, yeah, because I, I, we don't want to add, like there's things like uh, back up to, to S3 and GC, GCS. I actually don't want to add that to M3. <laughs> um, and uh, that's def there's definitely a use case for some of like the longer term retention clusters that we have. We'd prefer to actually do that, especially where the, uh, like the write load isn't very high. You know, not all metrics are kept for, for years. It's only usually a subset. So there's definitely some of the features N3 would love to you know have from from Thanos and um, and some and multi-tenancy stuff is probably less important to Uber. So, um, but it would be great to have uh, as well. So um, yeah. Yep. I, and I'll, again, like the whole point about the mergers, first we actually come come uh, come up with common interfaces that Thanos and Cortex uh, 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 like uh, integrate with. And in the end, like you can, run, uh, you can run a component of Thanos and you can run a component of Cortex because they're the same APIs. And M3 could come in, uh, implement those same APIs and you, you could also swap it with M3. Oh. Yeah, uh, we should catch up. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we are probably closing four minutes early. Oh, sorry. So we are probably uh, closing four minutes early. Thank you very much for staying until the end. Come by the booth, grab free stickers or a notebook or something. We have them under the table, but if you ask for them. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much and see you again soon.